Welcome back, everyone, to Accented Dialogues in Diaspora. My name is Philip Nguyen, uh, and I'm here along with my co-host, Mr. Viet Thanh Nguyen. Um, today, we're talking about uh, challenging discourses, and we're so um, delighted to have our guest for tonight's episode, um, Lan Yu, who is an associate professor uh, in cinema and media studies at the University of Southern California. She's the author of Treacherous Subjects, Gender, Culture, and Trans-Vietnamese Feminism, and her upcoming book project, Transnational Vietnamese Cinemas and the Archives of Memory, examines Vietnamese cin cinema and its history through the lens of the archive. Um, Professor Yung is a founding member of the Critical Refugee Studies Collective and co-edits the collective book series for UC Press. We're here to also talk with her about um, her recently, her and her, the collective's recently published book, um, Departures and Introduction to Critical Refugee Studies. Um, welcome. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the intro, Philip, and thank you for inviting me to be on um, this show. I'm happy to be here and happy to see everybody's in the house. Shout out to all the folks in the audience. And Hi. Viet too. Hi, Hi. Yes, I am Viet Thanh Nguyen. I'm the co-host of Accented Dialogues in Diaspora, along with Philip. It's such a pleasure to be here talking to Lan Yun, who I do get to talk to every day, but not in this kind of a context. And, you know, we, our topic today is refugees. Um, and of course, Lan, Lan Yung is an expert on that, given her membership or her, her, her belonging to the Critical Refugee Studies Collective and the new anthology that they've just put out, Departures and Introduction to Critical Refugee Studies. Um, I myself am a refugee. I came to the United States in 1975 and was settled through Fort Indian Town Gap in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, over 22,000 of us Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees came from Vietnam and Cambodia and were placed into this camp. And just a few years after that, 19,000 Cuban refugees came and took our place in these military barracks. So I'm, oh, I've always been you know, deeply curious, curious about the experiences of refugees, which is why I'm thrilled that we have this chance to speak to Lan Yung about her work. Uh, but you know, the first thing I want to I want to mention is that um, refugee issues are still incredibly important today. When I first started doing research on refugees around 2015, the United Nations High Commission on Refugees reported that there were about 50 or 60 million forcibly displaced people in the world today, uh, in 2015, of whom about 20 or 22 million were refugees. Now just seven or eight years later, the population of forcibly displaced people has grown to 103 million, and the population of refugees has grown to 30.5 million people. I'm wondering, Lan, if we can start off talking about that distinction that the UNHCR draws between forcibly displaced people and refugees. What's the difference between these two categories, and should it even matter? Of whether someone is forcibly displaced. Or okay, whether yes, <laughs> sure. Um, so with refugees, uh, a lot of people, scholars and mainstream thinkers, writers usually use the UN, the 1951 UN convention as a definition to, to begin with. And that convention spoke to a universal um, understanding of uh, what the refugee figure is is or who they were at that time. Usually they're defined as somebody who has a fear of persecution, usually because of their race, nationality, uh, sexual orientation, a religion, or um, uh, some kind of other political fear. And so that refugee, that definition for refugees have has still um, is still with us. The forcibly displaced um, definition has to do more. It can be somebody can can describe somebody who is internally displaced, so they haven't orders necessarily, um, but they can also um, be crossing borders at the same time. The forcibly displaced um, describe peoples who have been. Um, affected by human disasters, um, the violence of war, um, certain kinds of economic um, or, I'm sorry, ecological traumas. And so it the two, I think, fill in um, the, the, the definition for more global um, 
understanding of what it means to move uh, for a variety of different reasons. So in the book, we have uh, we actually begin with refugee in the UN uh, definition because we believe that it's high time to actually think of refugees in um, thinking um, in terms of refugees in um, other contexts and to perhaps think about refugees as they relate to the Palestinian community, the Palestinian diaspora, or who have no right of return. So one thing to think about when it comes to the definition of refugees is they have um, no desire or they cannot return. And that has to do with the, the idea of refoulement, um, this idea that you cannot return um, to your place of origin. And so therefore, when you seek refuge, uh, refugee status or seek asylum at another in another country, it means that you are, are forcibly um, uh, displaced there and you cannot return. So that's one of the distinctions between the two. Um, but we would like to change the definition of refugees to include those who are forcibly displaced for a variety of different reasons. One of the ways in which we argue that this redefinition needs to take place is because we have, uh, we, we make the case that historically and culturally, um, refugees need to be understood within the um, um, within the context of colonialism and war and, and imperialism. And so one of the things that I'd like to add to um, Ji-In's um, fulsome response is that it, um, critical refugee studies wants to show how these uh, layered histories of militarism and colonialism interlap in order to produce these subjects or subjectivities in the first place. So that's where um, our first intervention lies in, in the very beginning of the book where we define refugees and how we understand refugees to be, uh, need to be challenged, the very definition of it. Thank you so much for that, Jilang. And, and, you know, before we get um, into depth about um, this book, Departures and Introductions to Critical Refugee Studies, we're also really curious about um, your own experience as a refugee and how much of that um, experience informs or motivates your, your work. Yeah. You can speak to that. Yeah, no, it does um, in so many different ways. Um, most prominently is this uh, poetry book that um, is coming out through Texas Tech University Press. I'm so proud of it. It is called Nothing Follows. It's a, it's been in my heart and head for 25 years, and it's um, thanks to Travis Snyder and Isabel Tweepolo and Divan. Um, it will be published very soon. So that. Um, collection of poems deals with what I call refugee girlhoods. Um, and it's that sense of being a refugee, um, a young girl working in living in a working class neighborhood and trying to understand what I call this the wilderness um, that we left behind um, and the wilderness that we were about to enter into. That is puberty, adolescence, um, boys, new wave, um, being uh, traumatized by uh, family and community members, but still trying to have a sense of um, sense of girlhood, but also just understanding that um, we had each other. And so in the end, it is about women's relationships with one another my relationships to my sisters who were also young refugees and to my friends who were refugee uh, girls, just like myself. And so second um, work that uh, deals with refugees is uh, a book uh, that I'm writing academically um, called um, The Archives of Memory, Transnational Vietnamese Cinemas. And this, although it is a cinema book and it's very clearly defined by th those disciplinary boundaries, I write from the, the refugee perspective in terms of looking at the uh, archives. So it is a comparative study of um, being in the archives in France, the US and Vietnam, 
as a refugee and essentially looking at these images, these colonial images of Vietnamese natives or Cambodian and Laotian uh, others um, through a colonial gaze and trying to uh, see myself in that other, um, try to recognize myself and my uh, parents in these pictures and images. Um, and so that kind of gaze that I take in the academic book is very much refugee centered. And I'm going to talk about my refugee experiences, whether or not um, the mainstream audience wants to read it or not. Well, you, you know, you you mentioned your, and by the way, if you're just joining us, I am Viet Thanh Nguyen, the co-host of Accented Dialogues in Diaspora, along with my other co-host, Philip Nguyen. We are talking with Professor Lan Jung of USC's Cinematic Art School about refugees. She's an expert on the topic of refugees, and she's also herself a refugee. And we've been talking about her forthcoming book of poetry, Nothing Follows, which you can pre-order on the Barnes and Noble website, and I assume other websites too. I didn't realize that. It's very exciting to know that the book is almost ready to come out. Um, I say very exciting because uh, 25 years ago, I heard early work from this collection on a dark and stormy night in an Oakland studio. And so it's such a pleasure to know that this book is now forthcoming from Texas Tech University Press through a series that the Diasporic Vietnamese Artists Network is doing of Vietnamese diasporic literature. So I remember growing up as well in San Jose, California, among the Vietnamese refugee community in the 1980s, and witnessing some of what you were describing in terms of uh, the, the young Vietnamese Americans and, and the older Vietnamese refugee community, and remembering that sometimes the language used to describe the Vietnamese refugee community was a language of crisis the crisis of welfare, the crisis of gang violence, for example. So the Vietnamese refugee community, to a certain extent, was being pathologized by the non-refugee community. And that sense of pathologization, I think we still see it in general with refugees. When we hear about the refugee crisis that's global all over the world right now, the refugee crisis at our borders, the refugee crisis in the Mediterranean, and so on. That language of the refugee crisis is also being used to stimulate uh, the 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 necessity for nations and for non-governmental organizations to help refugees. But do you think that's a helpful language, a helpful image to use when uh, to deal with uh, the millions of refugees that are out there in the world right now? I think that's an excellent question, and I see that uh, somebody else has asked that as well, um, or to talk about um, this. Um, phenomenon of um, uh, violence that is at the root of um, immigration today. How do we describe that um, from a journalistic point of view or an academic or, or writerly um, point of view? So in the book, we um, argue for a new language. Um, in my work as a film studies scholar, I talk about how we need new images. And so um, two things. We need a new language and that one that displaces itself, the, the word crisis itself, because crisis always um, in, uh, connotes or implies that there is an urgency to the matter and that if it is not solved or resolved quickly, then uh, we're all in trouble. So there's, it's that kind of threatening apocalyptic language that I think does real harm to the kind of historical long view, the long durée that we're trying to argue is part of the refugee historical lineage um, that try, in, in looking at it from a historical perspective, then you have to see that these emergencies have been what constructed um, by the um, by mainstream media, um, by legislators, um, by activists, in order to make it seem like we have to again tempor temporarily at that moment resolve the problem. Um, but if you again seeing it from a long view, we know that these crises have been with us for a very long time, and that the um, the the urgency it it is um, 
absolutely part of a refugee's lived experience, but the way that it's been used as a way to resolve a problem, to resolve the crisis of refugees. I think that's what it is that we're critical about, that kind of use of language. So I also talked about um, needing new images. Uh, journalistically, you know, we have a lot of images that um, and that are juxtaposed with language with terms like crises, and you see the the humanity at its worst in in these uh, mainstream images by um, in global media that we have refugees that that are broken and in need, um, often children, often women, and so the the images are are very gendered. And these gendered images speak to how refugees are supposed to signal fear, persecution, and in need. Um, given that crisis mode in the language, given the urgency of need in the images, really um, what it uh, enacts in the viewer and the reader is this need to help, to help right away again. And I think it just... Um, activate something that that um, speaks to our need to help at the moment, or it it can also turn people um, off. They have compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the book, we're very adamant about speaking away from those images, speaking a different language, coming up with our own language. Like, what does it mean to wait? What does water mean for refugees? Um, and turning around the everyday language of refugees to um, make them mean something else. Again, that's the need for new languages. Um, new images would mean um, thinking about what refugees uh, would like to, how they would like to be seen um, and how they would can collaborate in their own image making. And that speaks to also the collaborative nature of how we talk with communities and not actually talk to communities. Uh, we collaborate with each other on the book and other events, and we collaborate with our subjects. So it's, it's um, a dialogue, it's a conversation, and we invite um, everybody to be in the conversation. You're muted, I think. Hi, everyone. Is my audio back? I might, sorry for that. Just gonna edit this part out. Uh, my name is Philip Wing, and I'm here with my co-host Viet Thanh Nguyen for Accented Dialogues in Diaspora. And we're in a conversation about refugees with USC professor Lan Yung. Um, and her and the Critical Refugee Studies Collective's new book, Departures and Introduction to Critical Refugee Studies. Um, so, Jilang, I, I want to ask um, for this book, it's published by the University of California Press, with, which is an academic publisher. Uh, but in your sort of reorientation and focus on creating this new language and new images that we can talk about refugees about, right? Um, the book itself being divided into four chapters of refugee critiques on law, fear, humanitarianism and representations, um, it's very readable and accessible to a non-academic audience as well, right? Could you speak a little bit about why this was important to the collective in, as you were working on this book? Yeah, absolutely. Because we wanted from the very beginning to, um, again, speak a different language. And <clears throat> this was written during the pandemic. And we and it was a collective effort, um, and we knew from the very beginning that uh, it, it had to speak to brighter uh, a broader swath than just us or each other, um, as in other academics. We wanted, as um, from the very beginning of the collective, we wanted to speak to so many different communities. Um, this would include students, activists, artists, scholars, public policy makers, um, teachers, uh, folks who are interested in uh, learning about who we are and what we do. And it was, um, um, we wanted to find 
um, a language that fits uh, that fits our subjects and fits the way in which we think now. Um, I think Yen and I thought. Well, when we started the writing of the book, we wanted to have a book that was very non-academic and that was still critical so, and to bring then the, uh, the idea of um, working with refugee communities um, to the mainstream. And so it's been important for us to have these uh, conversations across spaces, across community spaces, across academic spaces. Um, we had a reading at a bookstore recently, and it was a full house, and there were just um, the love for and the energy and the joy of being together um, as a community who are engaged with these um, topics. That was a beautiful thing to see, and it, it's something that we always try to um, do in fact when we have events and that is create a space for those folks to feel um, at least for a little bit less marginalized and more engaged in a, a, a decolonial thought in a, a, a radical understanding of how social relations can actually be. You know you uh, you have your uh, book of poetry coming out and we've interviewed many authors on this show. And of course, when we talk about authors, we usually speak about individuals, you know. Um, and yet with the collective, the Critical Refugee Studies Collective, you've made a turn towards the collective nature of uh, publishing and editing this book. What's What for you is the distinction between being an author and being a part of the collective? And what, what has being a part of a collective helped enable for you? Yeah, well, first of all, I think there is um, uh, an insistence um, on our part to uh, work against neoliberal notions of the individual and how the, so the, so um, the subject is sovereign um, and that this subject um, often uh, in its masculinist con configuration um, knows exactly how to write, what to write. And um, for example, they are uh, afforded the privilege of thinking about um, writing the great American novel. This is within literature or within the literary realm. So for my uh, first book on um, treacherous subjects and the idea of collaborations, um, why that act of collaborating is so important is because it pushes against the idea that um, the, uh, this, the and, uh, the subject is all knowing and that they are islands of knowledge. So when I um, uh, understand and theorize about feminist collaborations, it is a way to undo that kind of um, um, masculinist notion, I think, and patriarchal notion of the, the subject, often male, often understanding the world according to who they are. So with this kind of collaborative um, um, act, it allows us to recognize the ways that communities and coalitions work together to um, enact protest, to, to write together, to think together, to conceive together, and how powerful that is for, um, for the notion of um, a, to radically envision a community uh, where everybody belongs and um, where everybody can work together and think through, um, think together. Um, so that's the thrust of uh, feminist collaborations. And I use that as a way to think about how um, in departures, how everybody would have a voice, would um, um, have different writing styles, and it and it is not easy. It's a, a challenge to think about how we need to polish out or polish the language so it sounds uniform, um, or um, edit so that it it sounds um, consistent. 
Uh, but at the same time, the ways that uh, the ideas came together um, and the ways that our writings came um, were woven in together, that was an important point for us. So to make a, a long story short, um, it is an insistence on how um, strong and how powerful a collective can be. I would, um, and just kind of following up on the previous question too about the collaborative nature of the project itself, I wanna also um, probe your mind a little bit about um, the ways in which you, any challenges that were presented in speaking about this collective refugee experience as opposed to separate and distinct demographics or narratives, um, how might those be uh, informed by um, feminist, refu feminist refugee epistemologies? Um, mm. Thank you. That's a that's a mouthful. I know. <laughs> so we just say F R E for short, Frey. Uh, but so feminist refugee epistemology um, it comes from a concept that Yen Le Espiritu from UCSD and I came up with uh, in looking at two uh, different refugee communities, um, Syrian and Vietnamese women artists. And the reason why we uh, wanted to do that is because we felt that. Um, it, through this critical juxtaposition, which is a concept that um, Yen has come up with in, uh, in her book, In Body Counts, we were able to um, put together Syrian colonial and um, Vietnamese colonial, Syrian imperial and Vietnamese imperial histories together um, in a way that allowed us to uh, think about how these histories really overlap and how they are still resonant today. And that's exactly what we um, aim to think, uh, to, to argue uh, for when we think about critical juxtapositions that, that in this interweaving, what one can do is think about how um, there are these disjunctures, but also how these refugee communities have come to be because of these larger external uh, forces. Um, and so feminist refugee epistemology came about when we were thinking about how uh, these spectacular images of refugee suffering were so uh, horrible and dispiriting to look at, but how um, they have followed us too uh, from Vietnam to the present day, for example, thinking about um, the horribly named Napalm Girl um, and the um, the Alan Curdy's um, body that's uh, uh, that was uh, found uh, on a Turkish beach, how these um, images of abject trauma and suffering, how that seems to be um, a real problem at the very least and uh, trauma porn um, and all that. So feminist refugee epistemologies makes a stance to turn away from that kind of looking and turn away and and turn away from the spectacality or the spectacle of refugee suffering to think about interior um, interiority, to think about the feminine, to think about the domestic space as a potential site of um, a, a kind of production of knowledge that matters um, and can can speak and be as um, powerful as these as, as these kinds of other images. Um, in another piece with um, my scholar, a friend, uh, Leila Sharif on Palestinian cinema and Vietnamese cinema, we argue that this through crit critical juxtaposition, we, uh, we understand that it is in that domestic space that a radical motherhood um, or a radical notion of motherhood can be found um, it, when looking at um, uh, radical uh, or revolutionary filmmaking. So it is that kind of in, um, coming inward in order to talk um, outwardly about the ways in which um, women artists speak um, to one another and speak about their um, not trauma necessarily, but the ways in which war and exile and displacement have um, necessarily shaped the form, the content, and um, themes of their work. Well, 
I go around um, the country speaking often about refugee experiences, and I usually introduce myself as a refugee in the present tense, even though I'm clearly am not a refugee anymore, uh, technically or in the way I look or the way that I live. But I say that because to me, I still psychologically and emotionally feel attached to refugee experience and refugee history. And I feel that it's crucial to stand up uh, with other refugees and for other refugees. I'm just curious for you, a Professor Lan Jung, as we end our interview with you, what, how do you identify? Do you think of yourself as a refugee in the past tense or a refugee in the present tense? Um, present tense and um, always um, both refugee and a feminist. And I'm not sure which is <laughs> more prominent, but um, I believe that the, the two histories and or formations have shaped my identity so that I identify as both. Um, my refugee upbringing has shown me um, how to name um, myself and the refugee um, um, relationships that I've had with women, namely my sisters, as a way to name that as feminist. And it is different from Western feminism in thinking about um, private spaces versus public. Um, it was in the home that I understood what um, refugee feminism is all about. So I am both a refugee and a feminist. Thank you so much, Professor Lan. You, uh, Lan <clears throat> Thank you so much, Professor Lan Jung. I'm Viet Thanh Nguyen, and along with my co-host, Philip Nguyen, we've had such a great time talking to you about critical refugee studies. Thanks for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you, Viet, and thank you, Philip, so much for engaging with me and engaging with our book.